Now, this first session after Diane Archer's great plenary speech will focus on a reform plan and a strategy for achieving that goal of health care for everyone. And Jacob Hacker will lead us in that discussion. And then we'll have two expert commentators, uh, Maya Rocky Moore and Ezra Klein. And then uh, we will open it up for discussion. There are question cards to fill out back in the back. Please, if you have questions or comments, uh, try it that way. Uh, if we can make it more informal, we will. But uh, pick up uh, question cards that will be uh, uh, passed around. Now, uh, Jacob is here with us today with his daughter, Ava, who we're very happy to have with her, with us too. <laughs> Uh, they came down, yay, yay. Uh, they came down from New Haven. Um, and I would just want to briefly explain what a great resource Jacob Hacker has become to all of us working on health care. As an academic at Harvard and then at Yale, he looked closely at the last major attempt to get health care for all. Um, and it produced a book, The Road to Nowhere, the genesis of President Clinton's plan for health security. I recommend it highly. Uh, these days, you'd probably call it uh, the genesis of, uh, of Senator Clinton's health care plan. He was the co-author of Off Center, The Republican Revolution, and the Erosion of American Democracy, which really explained the right-wing ascendancy. And then came the great risk shift, the assault on American jobs, families, health care, and retirement, and how you can fa fight back. Now that book really explains why Social Security privatization failed, why the public really rejected Bush's whole ownership society. It explains the growing economic insecurity and volatility that affects families in the economy. And it helps us understand why citizens, why average people are demanding health care for all in this a very insecure economy. Uh, Jacob's not been satisfied with just describing what's going on. He's also put forward one of the most important plans uh, for health care for all called Health Care for America, whose latest version was published by the Economic Policy Institute about a year ago. And since then, we've taken this plan, which I'll let him describe to you, We've taken this plan to all of the presidential candidates who would listen. And of course, Dennis Kucinich was out there with his single payer plan and that had an impact. But we went to John Edwards and John Edwards was not near considering a single payer plan. But we helped him model his plan on health care for America, including the option of a public plan, as Diane explained, which Edwards, when he rolled it out, said could evolve into single payer, but without forcing people to give up, up what they had. Now, Barack Obama certainly didn't want to be seen as less progressive than John Edwards. And so you see the virtuous process of competition that you have in a democracy. And uh, by the time Hillary Clinton rolled out the details of her plan, it not, not only sounded a lot like the other two, but it went way beyond her original posture, which is let's just cover children in my first term. So we're gearing up for a general election in which health care is going to be a defining uh, differential issue between the parties. Our job is to get people to understand that choice. Our job is to criticize the policies and the practices of the insurance and drug industry and to make sure that the politicians don't throw over the side the best parts of the plans that they campaign on uh, this, this coming year. Uh, we need to build a movement. Um, we need to build a movement around the kind of health care plan that Jacob Hack has put on the table. You'll notice I didn't explain his plan. I'll let him do that. But listen carefully, because Jacob is operating at the intersection of progressive vision and practical politics, and we need people who operate at that level. Please welcome Jacob Hacker. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, 
it's a dangerous intersection perhaps to be at. Um, I know many of people who've gotten run over at the intersection of progressive politics uh, and practical politics. And, uh, and I want to start off with a few thanks. Um, first, I want to thank Roger for all that he's done to help uh, bring this plan to fruition and, and to promote it and to talk with me about issues it raises as well as I'd like to thank Diane Archer, who's been really intimately involved in the development of the proposal. <clears throat> I think the Economic Policy Institute deserves the thanks, not just for this, for all that it's done for advancing progressive policy ideas. The, the agenda for shared prosperity of which this proposal is part has been a, a great addition to the political debate. It uh, really defines, in my view, a set of workable, realistic, but also ambitious alternatives for progressive governance. And it really couldn't, we couldn't pick a time that, that such an alternative vision was needed, uh, uh, more fitting than today. Uh, my daughter is here, as I said, um, as Roger said, I'm very pleased that she was able to join me. She's, she's rather like me in a lot of ways. Um, she's, she's empirically minded, for one thing. Um, when she was a new kid at the Episcopal School that we enrolled her in down the block, she was asked to say grace at lunch. She said, and this is a quote, I believe, why do I have to thank God for my food? Dad makes my lunch, um, <laughs> which, I thought, which I thought was a good <coughs> skeptical position. So. Um, I'm told that I have uh, 20 minutes to explain my comprehensive reform plan, um, which reminds me a bit of the, one of the first evaluations I received as an assistant professor at Yale. It began promisingly enough. It said, Professor Hacker, if I had just 15 minutes to live, I'd want to spend it in your class, because that way it would seem like an hour. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER so, I, uh, so I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief, and hopefully it will seem close to the time allotted. Now, the one thing about bringing my daughter here that reminds me of a, a rule that we have in political science, which we call the grandmother rule, which is anything that your grandmother already knows uh, is probably not worthy of, of additional research. Um, and I think there's another rule, which I'll call the daughter rule, which is that if you can explain a health plan in a way that your daughter has any idea what you're talking about, you're doing pretty well. So we'll see at the end of this talk um, whether or not I pass that test. So I want to keep this at a broad level of, of and there's a lot of details in the proposal. I'll talk about a few of them. Um, but really what I want to talk about this proposal as is a template. Uh, a template, as Roger said, for figuring out how to get a good plan enacted. Um, there are a lot of great ideas out there that stand little chance of passage. There's a lot of bad ideas out there that seem to be uh, in favor among certain uh, constituencies. And the hope is that we can push to put a really good alternative on the table, one that isn't just, doesn't just meet the demands of policy purity, uh, but actually meets the, the standards of political realism. Now, that said, I, I wanna, I'm gonna put down some markers in this discussion, things that I think that progressives should not compromise on, and I believe already we're seeing heavy pressure to compromise on. Um, and so I wanna make clear that um, there is a point at which um, compromise is no longer a virtue. We need, uh, and I, I think that the Clinton health plan's uh, experience really drives that home. As I wrote in my book, the Clinton health plan was really a policy compromise that was, uh, that was confused with a political compromise. And that is that the folks who came up with the plan sat down and thought they were coming up with the, the best blueprint vision uh, for reforming American health insurance. And, and they thought that that vision was politically realistic as well. But in a lot of ways, they missed the big uh, and bottom line point, which is that you need to have a proposal that first and foremost is, addresses people's real concerns about health security in a way that they can understand. And second of all, you've got to think about a proposal that will build passion and build a movement rather than simply uh, in, incorporating an inside the beltway bargain. Um, it turned out that that bargain was impossible to achieve back in the early 1990s, but I think one of the reasons why it was was that the Clinton reformers really didn't start with the idea of what would be the political process and movement that would be needed and with the, the bottom line goal that they wanted to achieve um, from the very start, which I believe should be security for all Americans. Now, when I, when I talk about health security, uh, I think immediately of a story that I tell in The Great Risk Shift. It's of a family here pictured in a, in a New York Times article of 2005, the Dorsets. Now, Arnold Dorset on the left is an air conditioner repairman. Uh, he makes about $70,000 a year, a good living, um, since he's the only earner in the family. Uh, he makes that $70,000 a year, as it turns out, 
because he's working 90-hour weeks. And the reason that he's working 90-hour weeks and the reason his wife is staying home to care for their three kids is that their son, Zachary, who's pictured there in the football shirt, has a rare immune system disorder. Now, by the time this disorder is diagnosed, the family, which has insurance, has already run up $30,000 in credit card bills to pay for their health insurance. Not only that, they can't make their car payments, they can't make their mortgage payments, sounds familiar right now, they can't keep up with their daily expenses, and so eventually in 2005, they decide to file for bankruptcy. And when they do, Arnold Dorsett says the following, I make good money and I work hard for it. When I filed for bankruptcy, I felt I'd failed. Now Arnold Dorsett felt he had failed, that he was alone responsible for the plight that had befallen his family. But he was hardly alone. In 2005, two million American households filed for bankruptcy. We know from the statistics that about half of those bankruptcy filings are due in part to medical costs and crises. Go back to the early 2000s when about 1.5 million bankruptcies were happening a year. We're moving back to that level right now after the 2005 bankruptcy bill artificially de deflated the numbers for a year. Back in two early 2000s, about when one about 1.5 million households a year were filing for bankruptcy, that meant that a family filed for bankruptcy because of health costs and crises once every 30 seconds in the United States. And that's what we often miss. I'm going to talk more about the uninsured in a moment, but all of the focus on the uninsured, I think, misses the fact that there are millions of families like the Dorsets. There are families who are, think they're protected until someone gets sick. And private insurance has essentially failed us because it leaves millions of people in this situation. Just to give you a few numbers, they come from a recent Consumer Reports survey. Three in 10 non-elderly adults, according to Consumer Reports. So that's about, if you add that to the uninsured, we're talking about 40% to almost 45% of Americans uh, are either uninsured or uninsured, underinsured. And this group, three in 10 non-elderly adults that are underinsured, look very much like the, the insured, the well-insured, in almost all respects, except for that they're much less likely to get the medical care they need. They go without, med they postpone medical care, they put off vital purchases, they dig deep into their savings, they make job-related decisions based on the availability of health care, and as I said, they just don't look very different from the rest of us. When we, when we look at their income, and their race, and their family type, they are people like us, they may be us, but we don't realize it because we haven't needed care uh, in a way that runs us up against the limits of private health insurance. So when you hear about the 47 million uninsured, think about the fact that another third of, Americans or a third of American families or so are underinsured. And think about the fact that every two years, about one in three non-elderly Americans go without health insurance at some point. So these are people who are going to be vulnerable if they get sick. I can think of no graver indictment uh, of our system than these simple facts. Millions and millions and millions of Americans don't have coverage when they need it most. It's a failure of our society, it's a failure of our system, and it should be the focus of our efforts, first and foremost. We shouldn't be talking about helping those who are different from us, who don't have insurance at this particular moment, we should be thinking about helping the millions of Americans who really are just like us, but at risk because they don't have coverage that protects them or they lose their coverage or they're between coverage at a point when they most need it. And you know what happens when people don't have coverage, they get less care, they're more likely to die. Um, the Institute of Medicine estimated that if you just look at the uninsured, that's about 18,000 additional deaths a year. But uh, most recently, there's been a study of so-called amenable mortality in the United States. And that's people who die before the age of 75 because they didn't get effective and timely care. Well, they looked at 14 nations in the study. Uh, we ranked uh, right up there at the top, number 14. We are the worst nation of all these nations, nations with vastly different systems than ours. We're the worst nation. And Here's the numbers that they put out. If we had the average of the three best nations in terms of amenable mortality before age 75, 220,000 fewer people would die a year. So this is more than just 
a matter of dollar and cents. It's really a matter of life and death. So right now, because of rising costs, runaway costs, because of declining health security, we're starting to have a much needed national debate about health care. And what I want to talk about is where that debate, in my view, should go. And the first thing, as I said, that I want to emphasize is that we're talking about a problem, health insecurity, that affects all of us. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that any reform plan that doesn't simultaneously address costs and coverage will not address health insecurity. That is, if we just think we're going to mandate that people get private insurance or we're going to temporarily shift over to another system that will provide people with universal coverage without thinking about costs, we will fail, ultimately. We've seen that failure in Massachusetts already. Um, and even though the system has done much good, the fact is, is that in the long term it is simply not sustainable to expand coverage or require people to get coverage without thinking seriously about how to control costs. If those are the two goals, I want you to think about the problem of health care as being a lot like the problem of real estate. And that is that real estate is about location, location, location. Health care reform is about politics, politics, politics. To design an ideal plan is to forget that the bottom line problem is how to get the political support necessary to overcome the vested interest in our present system, and the major interest group lobbies that will spend millions, billions of dollars uh, influencing members of Congress and, and others against reform. And above all, it's about making sure that Americans feel confident and comfortable with a transition to a new system that will make them more secure. Already the right is trotting out horror stories based uh, on gross misreading of the facts about health care abroad and uh, public health insurance here. We're going to hear more and more of that old bugbear socialized medicine in the coming weeks. I think Mitt Romney uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, giving a preview of what was to come when he, when he described Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's relatively modest plans as European-style socialized medicine. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, I think the, the, the word he liked only slightly less than 9-11 was socialized medicine. We're going to hear this word a lot. And to fight it, we really need to be clear about what works and on what we believe in and how we can get them. So if politics is the issue, what does that imply for reform? It means that reform has to be simple. It has to be built on what works now, what's familiar to people. And it means that we have to address cost and coverage at once. We cannot let one be an afterthought. And the proposal that I've put out with the generous support of the Economic Policy Institute tries to do that. I, I want to thank the Economic Policy Institute again because they've done an enormous amount to make this effort possible. Um, not only have they supported the development of the proposal, but they've also supported the development of a series of cost and coverage estimates of the proposal from the Lewin Group that I'm going to talk about in a, in, a, in a second. So the proposal that I put out is called Healthcare for America. And as I said, I don't want to go too much into the details of the plan. I want to give you the big picture. The big picture is, the, is three elements. Shared risk, shared responsibility, and then finally, if necessary, an individual requirement that people have coverage. Now, I want to make clear that this proposal is not, it is not an individual mandate proposal, such as was seen in Massachusetts. The individual mandate uh, by itself is neither a popular nor an effective way to get expanded coverage. For one thing, it really, as I said before, doesn't deal with the long-term problem of making sure that coverage is affordable. Um, moreover, there is no way we can achieve the goal of universal coverage, expanded affordable quality care, without having employers con continue to be in the game of financing. Shifting those costs and those risks onto individuals and onto government is a recipe for the failure of reform. So the approach, that I, the approach that I propose essentially requires that employers either offer coverage or pay a relatively modest amount to enroll their workers in a Medicare-like plan from which those workers can, if they desire, get private coverage, a Medicare-like plan. And it also says if you're not enrolled automatically through your place of work, then you have to show proof of coverage. But most Americans would get their coverage automatically through employment. Indeed, the proposal, as we've elaborated it with the help of the Economic Policy Institute, actually enrolls everyone automatically in the Medicare-like plan at birth. 
and your employer simply has to say, if they provide coverage, I'm providing coverage to this worker, then you're allowed to coordinate the benefits with the Medicare-like plan so that people are basically uh, enrolled by their employer for that period of time. So there is no seam in transition and coverage. Everyone is covered automatically at birth and continues to be covered so long as, they're, uh, as they either have coverage through Medicare or their employer offers coverage. The benefits are quite comprehensive. I can talk more about those later, but basically they are Medicare plus very uh, generous additional benefits, very limited cost sharing, including cost sharing limited by income, and the premiums are quite modest. I'll leave this up for a second, but just to let you know, the premiums for coverage would be a maximum of $200 per month in individual payments for a family who gets coverage because they're employed. Now remember, this co plan covers all people who are, have ties to the workforce, either directly or uh, through a family member or because they're self-employed automatically. And that's about 96% of Americans. And if you take into account the fact that I enroll everyone at birth, most of the people who are not employed for a short period of time will already be covered automatically through the National Medicare Plan. I also do a bunch of other things that aren't worth going into. Let me show you the premiums really quickly. I also do a bunch of other things that aren't worth going into, but one of them that I want to emphasize that's not in either, any, either of the Democratic candidates' plan is I would take Medicaid and S-CHIP and fold them into this national plan. That means spending a lot more for those people because you have to upgrade the payments for those people. The provider payments under Medicaid and S-CHIP are horribly deficient, and thus many providers shun Medicaid and S-CHIP patients. Also, as you probably know, S-CHIP is being farmed out increasingly to HMOs and other plans that are not serving beneficiaries well. So the point is, I believe that if you're going to do this, you've got to do it right. You have to have a single national plan that's covering everyone who's not getting coverage through their employer, and that includes people who are now in Medicaid and S-CHIP. Uh, Despite that, the overall financing for the system turns out to be pretty favorable, mainly because the system moves towards one in which there are millions of people who are between coverage and there's hundreds, of, actually thousands of insurers that are fragmented and, and have very costly uh, administrative expenses towards essentially having Americans covered through the two parts of our system that work pretty well, Medicare and employment-based health insurance for well off workers, where the administrative costs are usually low and coverage is generally very, uh, very um, generous. So just to give you a sense of what that looks like, the current system, uh, as you can see, more than half of non elderly Americans get their coverage through their employer, um, but almost 20 percent of Americans have no, of non elderly Americans have no coverage at all. Um, under this system, you would move towards a framework in which about half of Americans get their coverage through their employer, and about half get their coverage through the Health Care for America plan. So this is, some people ask whether this is Medicare for all. Uh, my answer, uh, and, I, and it's a sincere answer, I, it's not a joke, is that this is Medicare for many. Um, and in fact, over time, it would evolve toward something that I believe would be a lot more like Medicare for all. Now, I'm going to skip a couple slides, well, I want to show you this one and then I will close. First of all, the projections are that this would cost about $50 billion a year in federal government spending to do this and that it would lead towards a, to a reduction in national health spending in the first year, a very small reduction, but it would basically cover everyone without spending another cent on health care. Over the next 10 years, it would save about $1 trillion. And you may ask, well, how can that be? Well, here's the answer. Um, the answer is that Medicare and bargained negotiated prices uh, is just much, much more efficient and cost effective than our current fragmented system of private insurers. So just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, this is actual health care spending, that black line. And that is health care spending, hypothetical health spending, if our spending had grown at the average rate of other rich nations. So if we had grown at the other rate of the rate of, and, and the other thing to note here is that in the mid-1980s, is when this kicks in. And this is true of Medicare as well. Medicare starts to really do much better than the private sector in the mid-1980s. If we had grown at the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development rate, we would be spending, and this is stunning, just over 11% of our GDP on healthcare right now. 
And that would be about a $450 billion difference in what we're spending today. So we could pay for Medicare and Medicaid and have a little bit left over for, for other fun health care projects if we had just tied our, our program to the, to the rate of increase of health care costs in other rich countries. All these countries are totally different. They don't all have a single national plan. Some of them have negotiated rates through quasi-public insurers. Some of them have uh, an individual requirement for coverage. Well, one of them, Switzerland, and only recently. Um, but in any case, there is a wide variety of plans out there. And they all do a better job because they do two things we don't do. They have universal coverage, and they bargain for lower costs. We have a plan that does that. It's called Medicare. And if you just look here, this, this, these two figures look almost identical because starting in the mid-1980s, Medicare started to control its costs much, much better. Over this entire period, it's grown about one percentage point a year slower, right? And if you look at the figure here, almost all of that is since the mid-1980s. So if you take the Medicare experience and you map it onto the foreign experience, what you will find is that Medicare is basically done about as well as most other rich countries have in controlling the rate of increase of cost. And the reason you can save a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, even though you don't move towards a, sing a universal single payer plan, is because when you've got half of Americans in a system that's actually controlling costs, you save a lot of money. And the last thing to say is that, well, where would this, this is the health spending estimates, I can come back to it. Um, where would this go over time? Now, I, I take these with a very serious grain of salt, but the Lewin Group did estimate what would be the effect of this kind of cost control in the Healthcare for America plan, the Medicare-like plan, if employers were required to spend 6% uh, of their payroll with that payroll-based uh, contribution to buy into this plan pegged to the rate of increase of the Healthcare for America spending? So there's nothing very fancy about this, right? It's just saying, the payment that employers make if they decide that they don't want to cover their employees directly is tied to the rate of increase of the Health Care for America spending. It's just assuming that employers are going to be financing the same share of that cost over time. So nothing aggressive, ambitious, crazy about that. Well, look at this. Over time, employers are going to increasingly retreat from providing coverage directly. And this is what Edwards was talking about when he said there would be a decline over time in the employer the role of employment-based health insurance and increase in the role of this new national plan. Um, it's not a conspiracy. It's right out there in the open. If employers decide or figure out how to control costs but still provide guaranteed full insurance, then they can keep that number from going in the direction I expected to go. But let's be honest. Employers are not eager to keep spending millions and billions of dollars on the system that is less and less valuable to them and more and more of a headache. And I think over time, we're going to see more and more employers shift away from providing coverage. But in the context of this plan, when they shift away from providing coverage directly, more and more Americans get secure, guaranteed, quality coverage through Health Care for America. Now, the last thing I want to say is about political realism. I believe that this plan can be done. I believe that it's realistic for two reasons. One, the financing needs of it are relatively modest. Maybe politics, politics, politics left out one thing, and that's financing. Financing is the Achilles heel of any reform plan. $50 billion is the amount of money that you can come up with to get a universal coverage. It's not at all clear to me that we can move towards a system in which all existing or almost all existing private spending is shifted over into tax finance spending. And the second, political point I want to make about political realism. This is realistic because ultimately it speaks to the key concerns of Americans. Americans like Medicare. They're familiar with it. They like the idea of having a guaranteed affordable plan. And they don't like the idea of leaving this to the hostage to the insurance companies. So there's one big fight, and I don't think we've entered it yet. It's not the fight that we know we're going to have between the proponents of doing nothing or doing too little on the right and those who really want to address this problem. It's a fight among those who believe in real solutions. And that fight is about private insurance. Make no mistake, if we mandate that people get covered through private insurers, reform will fail. We will fail if we do not deal with rising costs, runaway administrative expenses, and the true failure of private insurance to deal with either. We need to stand up and say that Medicare is the right solution and that private insurers have to compete with it and show they can compete with it for reform, to, 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 for if they want to be part of reform. 
So I'm not against having private insurers be part of the solution, but only if that solution involves the cent a central role for a Medicare-like plan competing on a level playing field with private insurance. That's what we should demand, and that's what we can achieve if we stand together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, I acknowledged one political leader on health care. I want to acknowledge another political leader who's in the room who can teach us a lot about health care for all. The leader of the Canadian New Democratic Party, Jack Layton, is here with us. He'll, he'll be speaking at lunch, but as you all know, the Canadians guarantee health care for every single one of their people. And, uh, and they have a lot to teach us about how to do this. Uh, now we're going to have reactions from two very smart and knowledgeable uh, people. Uh, this is a complicated set of uh, policy issues that we're discussing and political strategy issues that we're discussing. And one big question is, What's the level of ambition that we ought to set ourselves for, uh, too? Uh, the, uh, the single payer advocates think that we're not going far enough. Others think that, uh, that all you have to do is open the door, get some kind of health care plan like Massachusetts, and it'll all work out. Well, we have a couple of people that uh, are going to comment on Jacob and the situation we're in right now. Dr. Maya Rocky Moore who I worked with extensively on saving Social Security from the privatizers, is a respected policy analyst, researcher, advocate. She's the founder and CEO of Global Policy Solutions, GPS, uh, professor at American University. Uh, she served as vice president for research at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And she's on the board of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Please welcome Maya Rocky Moore. Thank you, Roger, and thank you to my distinguished uh, colleagues on the dais. I have been working on this issue for quite some time. And when I worked on Capitol Hill, it always used to strike me that I would go into one room, a coalition of uh, single payer advocates, universal health care advocates, and it would look one way. And then I would go into another room, a coalition of people who were focused on reducing health disparities, and it would look a completely different way. Both were talking about the same thing. How do we reduce uh, the number of uninsured in our country? How do we increase the quality of affordable health care in this country? Uh, how do we turn this system around? Our system is broken. Yet they were in two separate rooms. So I have been dedicated, I have dedicated my uh, focus on this issue to making sure that we merge the two issues uh, because they are uh, just talking about different parts of the same sick body. So a lack of health care, access to health care in this country is not only just the most immoral and egregious uh, crime uh, of, of contemporary society, it is also the biggest and most egregious civil rights issue of our time. Now we often talk about a lack of coverage by income, and you can see the uninsured in terms of how income impacts the uninsured rates, uh, with uh, lower income people being uh, disproportionately uninsured. But we rarely talk about it in terms of race and ethnicity. And so if you look at it, uh, Afri actually African Americans, Latinos, uh, Asian Americans are, are less than 30%, just short of 30% of the nation's population, but they are more than 50% of the nation's year-round uninsured uh, statistic. Uh, and so if you look at this, Hispanics, more than 30% uh, are uninsured uh, year-round. Uh, African Americans, it varies between 19 and 20% hovers between that. Asians just slightly below. And if you see there, you see that uh, Caucasians actually experience the lowest uninsured rates in the nation. And if you want to actually look at it in a different way, we can understand that uh, if you want to look at it by health insurance coverage type, 
uh, that uh, whites actually uh, enjoy the highest percentage of coverage uh, in the uh, private plans uh, in the United States, African Americans around 50 percent. But if you actually look at who is disproportionately reliant on governmental health care, you can see that African Americans at that yellow line are disproportionately reliant on government health care uh, and at that lower rate, whites. And I didn't have the statistic for Latinos on this one. So we have a broken system. And actually, it's, it's my belief uh, that uh, the reason why uh, that uh, the system is, is broken is because it has relied strictly on employer-based health care or largely on employer-based health care. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 60 percent of non-elderly uh, Americans were covered by health insurance related to employment in 2003. Within this group, about 75 percent of whites received health insurance through their employer complained, compared to only 52 percent of African Americans. That is the statistic I showed you a few minutes ago. Now, the shortcomings of the system. The employer-based system as we know it stacks the deck, stacks the decks, so to speak, uh, in favor of high-wage, highly educated earners, full-time workers, and or workers in certain business sectors. We know that the system is broken because we have this huge year-round uninsured problem, but something we also don't talk about uh, often is that the structure, the very structure of the system itself, uh, contributes to racial disparities in access. Why? because that we know that disproportionately high-wage, highly educated earners reflect the, uh, the whole system of education that we have in this country, uh, where, and actually that's my cell phone, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where uh, disproportionately uh, people who are lower educated, who are lower income, tend to be, uh, reside in those places where they had uh, poor access to quality public schools that means that, that means that they didn't necessarily get an opportunity to get a higher education and that of course uh, has an impact on how they access uh, employment and also how they access white collar benefits. And so it's the system overall that's structured and because the healthcare system relies on an employer based system which by its very nature is actually structured to favor white collar high wage jobs in terms of providing full access to healthcare coverage. It, it by, by its very nature, is designed to create those health disparities and access that we saw a few minutes ago on the chart. And of course, you know, we can say that we have Medicaid, but it's challenged because the services are limited in scope. Providers often do not accept patients because of the poor reimbursement rates. And basically, policymakers are quick to cut it in a heartbeat. If they're experiencing budget uh, problems, they will cut the number of people el eligible. They will cu cut the quality or the types of services eligible. And so it's a very arbitration, ar arbitrary system as we currently know it. So the problems of our current healthcare system is it does not focus on prevention, it's highly inefficient, costly, does not emphasize quality of care, is not designed to cover all people. A total paradigm shift is now necessary in the way U.S. healthcare is financed and administered because not only are we facing these egregious uh, uh, health disparities and numbers of uninsured, but the system is unsustainable as is. So what are the elements of a good healthcare system? Now I should just pause and say this. For years I have stood on stages with uh, Congressman John Conyers and I have talked about the benefits of single payer. I have worked with uh, physicians for a national health plan and I have uh, stood uh, because I actually believe uh, that single payer is absolutely uh, uh, an appropriate way to think about how to cover all people in America, how to spread risks across, how to create a system that uh, has uh, access for all uh, and that reduces, as I mentioned before, uh, disparities in access by uh, race, ethnicity, and certainly by income. And with that, uh, in this, actually, this portions of this presentation were designed before I knew the full details of Jacob Hacker's plan. But I came to a point of understanding that a good health care system had certain elements. Uh, it was universal in its access to quality care. It had access separate from employment status because, as I mentioned before, you know, depending on the type of employer you have depends on the, the, whether you get access to quality care or whether you, I mean, whether, it's, uh, whether you get access at all. It has affordable consumer costs 
It spreads risks broadly. This is particularly important for minority, racial and ethnic minorities uh, because uh, they tend to uh, have higher health disparities and when they're doing the underwriting, uh, they tend to either be uh, denied because of pre-existing conditions if they can get access uh, or, uh, or they, um, they have higher health care costs. Uh, and so to spread risks means that insurers are not propelled or compelled uh, to uh, visit those kind of disproportionate and higher costs on people who um, have a different health status. It would be structurally efficient, meaning that it would maximize access and quality while reducing administrative costs and duplication. We all currently know that another failure of the employer-based system as we currently have it is that its administrative uh, duplication is significant and, and, and just uh, awful. It contributes to the higher uh, costs of the system. Uh, and so it would be a structurally efficient system. There would be no discrimination based on health status, gender, age, or region. Uh, Roger mentioned that for the last three years, I create, three years ago, I created a company. Uh, it is a for-benefit, for-profit company which focuses on policy and program development. But with that, I have become an employer. And I now have six employees. And it, this whole thing, what before was theoretical uh, and understanding, now becomes very real to me. And I was actually shocked to find that it actually costs me more as an employer and costs individuals more as an employer if you're a woman, uh, because, especially a woman of childbearing age. And so the, the, the pricing is significantly different for women of a certain age as opposed to men. So it would be a system, a good system would be one that did not discriminate based on health status, gender, age, or region. It would be early and consistent, it would provide early and consistent access to prevention information, supports and incentives. It would maximize the use of information technology to track best practices, healthcare costs, and quality indicators such as provider performance data and patient outcome data. And it would uh, have administrative incentives for the promotion of equal health outcomes. Uh, and so with that, I read through Jacob's plan, and it does pretty darn good. It does pretty darn good. The whole notion of uh, no underwriting, um, uh, or, or actually, let me start, the whole notion of access separate from employment status, absolutely. It creates uh, health care for America, which means that you can actually buy into the system without actually being connected to an employer, uh, which is good for those who are uh, uh, habitually unemployed or experience unemployment for any reason, good for those who are early retirement, are early retirees, also good for those who might not have access to the health care system because, or employment basis uh, costs because they are you know, disabled or whatever. Uh, so the notion of delinking it uh, from employment status is a good one and is encompassed in this Health Care for America plan. It has affordability, the affordable consumer costs bullet. Uh, the, community, the community rated premium uh, concept that's contained in this uh, Health Care for America uh, program uh, does indeed get rid of the whole notion of uh, disparities uh, in terms of pricing. Uh, it provides a single level of pricing uh, for those who are higher waged. It is affordable, and so it certainly meets that test. Uh, the program that's provided by uh, Healthcare for America is a fail-safe against the loss of insurance due to, to employment, early retirement, or disability. It provides subsidies for the low income. It also provides a way to link S-CHIP, Medicaid, and Medicare. Uh, and we can talk about this, Jacob, in the discussion. I'd be very interested to hear more about how uh, the contributions of those under 65 could possibly help with the financing of these other systems. Uh, it also uh, gets rid of uh, it or promotes administrative efficiencies due to its reliance on a large single national health insurance pool through the creation of Healthcare for America. And I firmly believe this. As a person who has stood uh, on stages uh, in, many, in front of many audiences talking about the benefits of single payer. I actually believe uh, that health care for America provides a way to transition to an even larger national insurance pool, what we call single payer. And this goes back to the political realities. We have a system, and I'm talking about our global economy, where businesses are operating in a global environment it's becoming increasingly competitive. Uh, they have to, especially U.S.-based uh, companies, have to compete 
uh, with wages, lower wages in other uh, uh, parts of the world, uh, with companies that are doing business in other parts of the world. And so absolutely healthcare costs are becoming a yoke and a burden that they do not actually want to carry. So if we actually look at the evolution of what's happening with business, we can understand that uh, over time, it is actually likely uh, that more and more uh, employers will get out of the business or want to get out of the business of providing private insurance and that more and more people will actually transition to uh, the Health Care for America plan. And with that, many of those advocates who want a pure single-payer system may actually end up getting it. Thank you. Well, Ava, I think he's, uh, I think they're giving him his plan pretty good grades here. Uh, we'll see on the next one. Um, Ezra Klein is one of the real journalists and policy intellectuals on the blogosphere. Uh, he doesn't just have opinions. He reports and breaks stories for the print and on online versions of the American Prospect, and his work has appeared in the LA Times, The Guardian, The Washington Monthly, The New Republic, Slate, all kinds of places. And he's a frequent guest on MSNBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews. Uh, he's very good at teasing out the logic of the healthcare debate. How's this for a pithy Ezra Klein explanation of the two parties' approach to healthcare? The Republican vision is for a world in which the sick and the dying get to de deduct some of the costs of their health insurance, which they don't have and can't get, on their taxes. The Democratic vision is for every American to have health insurance. Are we clear? <laughs> Please welcome Ezra Klein. Well, thanks to Roger for that uh, terrific introduction. And don't let him fool you. I have plenty of opinions. You know, over time, I, when I got into healthcare reporting, I sort of strangely got into the policy first. I found that to be very fascinating. And in the past couple of years, I've begun to realize that it's really, as Jacob said, the politics of politics of politics. And in that vein, I did an article recently for my magazine, The American Prospect, and uh, I think I have to say that like 10 times while I'm here, so I write for The American Prospect. <laughs> and I spoke to Lawrence O'Donnell. I was reporting on what happened in 1994, what happened in the last great healthcare reform battle. And Lawrence O'Donnell was a chief of staff for uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who chaired the Finance Committee and was a guy who really health care had to go through, and he wasn't actually all that helpful in that battle. But O'Donnell is very, very pessimistic on our chances here. He said, you know, if I were telling a presidential candidate, you know, if they can do health care, I'd say no, and then I'd say no, and I'd say no, and I'd say no, and I'd say no. And he said, you know the way to understand 1994? There's this one book written on it, and it's very short, so you'll be able to read it, Ezra. There's this one book, and it'll show you why we can't do health care. He said, I can't remember the author's name, but the book is called The Road to Nowhere. I said, Jacob Hacker? He said, yeah, that's the guy. So <laughs> the good thing about what you're seeing up here today is you have people who really have a deep and serious understanding of the political troubles and obstacles we're about to face, and they're optimistic. They see a way forward. And that's very, very, very important. Now, a couple things. One is that Jacob mentioned how socialized has become the sort of word du jour in the Republican primary. Harvard recently did a poll asking Americans about socialized medicine. 39% said it would be worse than what we have now. 12% didn't know. 45% said it would be better. They preferred socialized medicine to the patchwork, broken down system we have today. So that slur may be losing its power. But one of the problems in healthcare reform is not just the fear of socialism, but as Stuart Altman once said, everybody's got their favorite plan, and the status quo is everybody's second choice. And that is sort of what I wanted to talk about here today. Jacob's plan is a terrific plan. And if you're a single payer advocate in this room, I'd really say get on board with it, because I think it's probably your best shot. That's my read of the votes, and maybe I'm wrong, but he's really got, got a fascinating structure there. The one worry I'd have with it is that in Jacob's plan, costs are controlled by in the sort of this, the healthcare for America market that he creates, you have um, essentially mandated cost controls the way you have in Medicare. It can only grow GDP plus a half a percent, which is less than it grows in sort of in the private market now. That one's gonna be a tough sell in Congress and what worries me about it is that, um, we need it by the way, but what worries me about it is that the Democrats who took Jacob's plan didn't keep that part 
and that takes out a lot of their cost controls. And if you don't have cost control, you cannot have universality. You can't have it. So that's going to be a big fight, getting any plan that actually does control costs. So that's where I'd begin. But let me say this. Jacob said it's politics, 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 and it is. But what he didn't say enough about were votes. It isn't just politics. It's about votes. It is getting to 60 in the Senate. That is the only way you do health care. There's not another, not another avenue. The House, it works like the old Soviet Union. You can get whatever you want through there. But you need to get to 60 in the Senate. And so any plan you have where you can't tell me where you get those votes, you don't have a plan. You have a position. And nobody gets medical coverage from a position. So I think what a speaker is supposed to do is tell you, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes and we're going to move to Q&A because we want the back and forth. That's true. But I actually want to talk about what's going to happen in the Q&A here. Because when I've been in these before, what happens is people get up and the folks on the, on the stage, we give you our favorite plans and Jacob gave you his and it's a great plan and I've got mine, which is a sort of third way left right compromise of we invade France and take their health care. <laughs> and folks in the audience stand up and then they say, have you heard of HR 646? It's a great plan, John Conyers, and it is a great plan. John Conyers is a, is a great guy and a patriot uh, and, a, and a scholar and a, uh, and a handsome man. And you, <laughs> And, and just goes sort of on down the line. Somebody who works in health insurance gets up and says, listen, we have a lot of problems. What we really need is reform, a hybrid system. We, you, know, you can't have so much disruption from single payer. The hybrid is the only way to go. And then sometimes you'll get the LaRoucheites in the corner, and they'll stand up and they say, we need a plan from Greek platonic principles. <laughs> and then so we hear that. But you don't hear about votes. And that's really what we need to hear about. In, in my experience, what we have in sort of the liberal approach to healthcare politics is too much policy dogmatism and not enough political dogmatism. We are, we are political agnostics and policy dogmatists. And that's a very strange position to be in. And it's not one, I, I mean, as I said, when I got into this, I got in on the policy. And the policy is fun because you create what you think would be the best plan. It's a remarkable puzzle, and it's exciting, and it's intellectually um, um, fresh and challenging. But we actually need the opposite. What we need is to insist first before we ever talk, not before we talk about plans, because plans are part of the discussion, but we need to insist on a way to get those votes. That needs to be your first, um, your litmus test. That needs to be the first test a plan passes before you consider it very seriously. Say, okay, that's great. How does it work in the Senate? Where do your votes come from? Because you know what? You're going to need them. It's very unlikely we get to 60. It's very, very unlikely. Maybe we get to 57 or 58 if we're lucky. But even there, you have you know, not all that much unity in the Democratic caucus, right? There's Max Baucus, who chairs finance, and is going to be a critical guy in the next fight. And that's a truly unfortunate thing. But he's going to be a critical, <laughs> critical politician in this battle. He chairs a relevant committee. And what he really likes to do is compromise with the ranking Republican, Senator Grassley. He likes to run things in a bipartisan manner. So do you get Max Baucus onto your plan? How do you do it? And that, I think, is what we don't give enough thought too. There are so many people in this town who do such smart policy thinking and create such remarkable um, research that we all use that I use all the time. I have on my, on my blog a feature called Graph of the Day and I don't have a PowerPoint. I can't use PowerPoint. I'm just learning Excel. And so I have to use everybody else's graphs and all their PowerPoints and I appreciate that they make them. But this is really, and, and this is just what I want to draw home. So I'm just going to keep saying it. it's a political problem and a problem of votes. And for all the work that goes into creating a thousand plans, Senator Daschle is going around town right now, former majority leader, saying what we need is a health care federal reserve. We need a health care federal reserve. And sure, we do need a health care federal reserve. <laughs> It'd be a great idea. Except that when that first ad goes up, saying Senator Daschle and the Democrats and whoever is else, else is on that team, they want to put the health care decisions to a politically independent, largely unaccountable board of um, government appointed bureaucrats who will decide your health care, how do you respond? Now maybe he's got a response, but he's not telling anybody. And it's a weird tick of this, um, of this town that this is a guy who's worked in politics, Senator Daschle. He's been down these roads before. He was there in 94. And when he left politics, he didn't go into advising on politics. He went into policy. And that, to some degree, is our problem. Jacob talks, uh, he mentioned earlier, that what they had in 1994 was a policy compromise and not a political one. And he's right. It's a large part of what killed us. On the back table, there's a sort of, uh, 
you know, 40 or so of uh, printouts of the article I did in 1994, which Jacob um, was a key interview for. And, and I, I advise people to pick them up and read them because what we need to do is, is not repeat these mistakes. It is a political problem and it's a problem of votes. And until you know we are getting those votes in the Senate, you do not have anything done. Because at the end of the day, this is about getting something done. If I were to tell people how to approach um, health care reform, and I think that's what I'm up here to do, I'd say what you want is principles and you want politics. I would not worry so much about policy, but you need to figure out what you need. Uh, um, both uh, uh, my other colleagues up here on the panel, they explained a couple of the principles that they have. I would argue for you need universality. It needs to be universal. It is a moral stain and an economic inefficiency to not cover every American, and we should be embarrassed of it. You need to have integration of the system. You know, Jacob had a, uh, had a graph up there, and it showed a pie chart of where people get their coverage. And in sort of Jacob's plan, what you had was 44%, I believe, get their coverage out of the new Healthcare for America Act, and then 41% get private insurance. And on these graphs, the private insurance part, it's like one big part of the pie. It's like all in red. But it's really a 1,000 different insurers, some of them going through the individual market, some of them going through um, the private market, or not the private market, the employer market, some of them through your employer, some of them Aetna in California, some of them Blue Cross in Massachusetts, and everyone is different. So whatever you want to do to control cost or to make the system better, there's nowhere to do it. It's a difference between telling one preschooler what to do and telling a room of 800. You've got to be able to put the system under one roof if you're ever going to get a handle on it. So I'd say integration. Then you need insurance reform. I'm a little bit, I, I would love to have a public plan. I worry about the votes on it. I think that liberals really need to fight on this one and hopefully we, we win. But one way or the other, the insurance market is sick. Insurers cannot give you good care, even if they wanted to. Even if they wanted to be good guys, the day an insurer gets up and says, you know why you should come to Aetna? It's because we have the best diabetes care in the country. Is the day they get a bunch of people with diabetes and that is the year in which they go bankrupt. If they want to give you good care, <clears throat> they can't. They cannot compete on care. They need to get the healthiest among you, so you cost them the less, and they can go back to their shareholders with the best reports, and then their CEO can get uh, a bazillion dollars and retire in luxury and move to philanthropy to save his soul. <laughs> That's currently how it works, and it isn't their fault. It is a market we have set up for them. It needs to be changed. They need everybody bought in, one way or the other. They cannot discriminate based on um, uh, gender, they can't discriminate based on pre-existing conditions, based on age. All that is crazy and we need to end it. So they need to have a reform market one way or the other. And then sequentialism. And this is where Jacob's plan is really a remarkable sort of idea. You're not going to get everything you want in your first bite at the apple. You're not going to get every cost control you want. You're not going to get the single payer there. Sorry. What you may get is the ability to create a system in which the natural incentives move you in that direction in which what you have built creates natural momentum to the places you want to go. And Jacobs does. It creates something for you to buy into that becomes a better and better deal over time and um, moves closer and closer to a, a fully integrated national healthcare system. So at the end of the day, that's where I would go on principles, but you can have yours and, and we can argue back and forth. But it is politics. It is 60 in the Senate. And, and I, I don't want people to forget that because I said for us, it's a political problem, and it is. For many of the people in this room and certainly the people on the stage, it's a political problem. But for 47 million folks out there, it's an everyday problem. It seeps into the cracks of everyday life. It makes their worst moments all the scarier. And for many above that, it's insecure and expensive and a burden. And so for them, it's an everyday problem. And it needs to be solved. They can't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the very good. And that is up to us not to let it happen. So thank you. Nice and provocative, thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, okay, we're gonna have some discussion now. Uh, should we give up on the cards altogether and just uh, ask people to go to a microphone? Uh, there's a microphone set up back here. And uh, I'll just ask our panel to stay seated and I hope these microphones are working, so go ahead. Um, I must say I'm a little more nervous now because of Ezra. I'm concerned I'm going to ask a very predictable question, but um, so be it. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit, or ha have you talk about 
what compromises should we be willing to make and what shouldn't we? The, the thing you said about building a road that you do want to go down mm -hmm. rather than building a road that takes you over a cliff and you end up with a bad system that, that stops further reform from being able to happen. And I'd just like to know what, what are compromises that are okay and what are some things that we really ought to say, nope, um, this isn't going anywhere. Well, I'll say very briefly a few things. I, I think this will probably come up more in the, in the, as the conversation goes forward. Um, I like Ezra's principles. Um, and, and in fact, what I would, I would go back on his question of votes. I, I think that we should um, be careful not to fixate only on where you can get votes in the current political context. Mm -hmm. Because there are, I, I would put a list of three ways you get the votes. One is that you elect a lot more Democrats. Um, and <laughs> And I think, I do think that there is, there is a fear, I do fear that we're going to try to operate this as, and this, you know, this is part of my concern about the way Ron Wyden is operating now, though I think he's doing a great deal of good, is that it's a little bit, you know, what can we get in the very narrowly the present political context? So we should be thinking about how we can shape it. So the two things I would say is we have to have a movement and we have to elect Democrats. Then I think, I agree completely, it has to be congressionally centered. Uh, and it has to be principle oriented rather than policy detail oriented. In terms of principles, Let's go back to, this is somewhere between a principle and a, a policy element, but I do think that the public insurance plan um, is, is very close to being a kind of essential element of, if not, if not, if, if it's not something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't ever be willing to compromise away, it should only happen under the most mm -hmm favorable circumstances where everything else that you believe in and think you can get under the, under the present circumstances uh, is in your hands. Because there, as I said, I really don't think that we can regulate our way or mandate our way to getting insurance, private insurance, to operate in a public spirited way. Um, and that's why I am encouraged that each of the, the leading candidates on the Democratic side had, had and has as a component of their plan, a public insurance option. What I worry about is that it's being seen at the moment, and I think Ezra probably would, would second that this is how it's being seen, is this is a way, you know, we'll get the single pair of folks, they'll like this. And I think that's, it's not, it's not like a, um, it's not like a decal on a car, right? It's the engine of the car. So if we do not see it that way, and, and think about, well, if it's that something that's going to be compromised, w what are we giving up, A, and what are the ways in which we can achieve those same goals be, then I think we're going we're gonna to lose the long-term battle to uh, put in place sequential reforms, as Ezra was saying. So that's, to me, that's the place where we, the rubber meets the road. And I think that, that to do that, the American people are with us on this. To do that, we have to make the case against private insurance, right? This is not, this is not going to be, this is not a game that's going to be won with these kind of strange bedfellows coalitions where everyone gets together, comes out of a room and says, well, we all agree, you know, that private insurance has done some bad things in the past, but now we're all on the same page and we're going we're gonna to put in place rules and they're going to do the right thing and, and it's, everything's going to work out. No, it has to be, from the very beginning, this system has failed us and it's failed us in part because we've let private insurers do things they should never be allowed to do, A, B, and we haven't been committed to the idea, the ideal, that we would have a universal social insurance structure as the core foundation of our system. So that, if that, and that requires some, some, uh, uh, some tough words about private insurance again and again and again. Uh, you need to have an enemy in any battle, and there are two enemies that I would like to have. One is the right and their prescriptions for individual mandates and for, for basically putting, as, as Ezra nicely put it, Put it, putting people more at risk, making them pay for coverage they can't afford that won't protect them. Second of all, we need to take the private insurance industry on, right? It is, a root, it is at the root of the problems. Okay, the system means that they operate the way they do, but the system was shaped in large part by their needs and interests. So that's, to me, where we shouldn't compromise. Ezra, briefly? Yeah, let me jump in on this. Um, I, didn't, I don't want to suggest that what you should do is try to forge a compromise right this second. One of the ways you get votes is you make people afraid to vote against you. And that is what this election should fundamentally be about. Yeah. Whoever wins this sort of uh, Democratic primary that's going to go on until 2012, they need to be willing to <laughs> run on health care. The groups sort of in this room, uh, uh, you know, move on and, and calf. Somebody said to me when I was writing one of these articles, the story of S-chip isn't written yet. It's written when we beat the Republicans on it. You beat a couple high-profile Republicans on voting against health care for children, they become more afraid of voting against health care for adults. You need to make health care 
to Republicans like what Republicans made Iraq to Democrats. You need to scare them and make them want it off of the table. And I'll say one more thing. I was at the AHIP conference, the Association of Health Insurers, um, a week ago, and they're afraid. They know they're about as popular as a skin lesion, and they know that, the, you know, you saw, those, you saw those numbers up there. We can't afford this forever, not the way it's going right now. And they know perfectly well that if the system collapses, it goes on them. Because people may not like pharma, but we need drugs, and they do like doctors, and you need hospitals because you don't want to bleed on the carpet. So you need the other centers of profit in the system, but you don't need insurers. And scaring them with the uh, possibility of single payer and keeping the public plan in there, I think you may be able to get it. But keeping it in there at the very least until the last minute, you don't compromise from 50%. You let them bargain you down from 100 and you stay where you need to be. But you know the, the public plan is the center of the liberal strategy on this because it is what they fear most. Maybe we can keep it in in order to let them stay in the system, but you don't give it up quickly, not at all. Okay. Um, and let me just note that the recent uh, special election where the Democrats won in, in Illinois in Hester's seat, uh, S chip was a big, big uh, part of that attack. Yes, sir. Um, th th I'm, you can see my uh, Camp Wellstone shirt on, so you can tell I'm, I'm, I'm a single payer advocate. But I can understand uh, that pr Professor uh, Hacker's plan can functionally seem to serve as a bridge to single payer. But let us not forget that the health insurance industry is fully aware of your plan. I'm sure they've studied it as closer than probably anybody in this room. They've got probably staffs of people this, you know, studying it and looking for ways to, uh, to play games. Like they're gonna try to sabotage anything we do. It's a trillion dollar industry. They understand that our ultimate aim is some kind of single payer plan and all these savings of hundreds of billions of dollars, guess who's, whose pocket that's gonna come out of? The health, health insurance industry. So I think we have to take into account what they're going to do in reaction to this, and we have to understand, I think you said it very well, in, in some sense, not making it personal, but they are the enemy. We've got to make this a voting issue, not, for the, not just for the Congress people, but for every American, it's got to be a voting issue at the polls so that we, they understand that the insurance industry, in an objective sense, is parasitic. It's unnecessary, it doesn't belong the way it is now. We've got to get rid of it the way it is now, and we mustn't be afraid to call for that. Great, Thank you. Uh, great, let's get some re reaction. Amen. <laughs> Actually, the point I want to make is you're absolutely right. Uh, but with that, uh, the point I was trying to make is that we actually need new, a coalition of coalitions. Mm -hmm. You actually need to make the case to people that aren't necessarily in the same uh, coalition with uh, the universal health care. There are different people out there, different coalitions that actually have the same goals, but they're f focused on different aspects. So we need to make, bridge the divide and make the linkages so that we can actually have massive traction on the grassroots level. Yes, sir. Hi, David Rabin, Physicians for National Health Program. I think the uh, discussion's been terrific. I find the hacker plan to be very appealing intellectually. Uh, we need not only universal access, but uh, adequate coverage when people do have insurance. And I think, uh, Jacob uh, Hacker, you said in the course of your remarks and uh, acknowledged the reality that we will not, as a nation uh, in our history, uh, be able to control a private insurance and endorse private insurance segment uh, of our health care. And therefore, I think unless we push for an ideal system, which is a single payer system, I think we end up with compromises. The Clinton and Obama plans are compromises of your plan. Uh, and when you start advocating in Congress with a compromise plan, you end up with an inadequate plan. And I would like you to tell us how you can assure in a political debate, you're, political, you're trying to be a political realist, you can avoid that. Thanks. Well, so I, I guess I would say first that I can't, and none of us can assure that. Um, and I think actually at present, um, there's reason to think that even these compromises that the candidates have made are, are on the outer bounds of what's politically feasible in the present moment. And so I, I do think that the, the, the larger challenge is really to change the boundaries, the political boundaries. Um, and, but let me, let me say a few more words because I, I, I sometimes find myself in the position where I'm, I recognize, I, I get a lot of attacks from, 
from people who are supporters of single payer, uh, and a lot of nice words as well. And I read religiously uh, the Physicians for a National Health Program blog. It's great. And some of the stuff that they uh, put up there is extremely helpful. What, what, I, what I think is worth emphasizing, though, is that the, the idea that I have, the proposal that we have out here, is one in which you would have more than half of non-elderly Americans covered by a single national plan. And moreover, if these numbers are to be believed, you would move over time towards a system in which um, you're talking about two-thirds or so of Americans covered by a single national plan. It seems to me that that is exactly what the Physicians for National Health Program has rightly been demanding. Um, and that to put, to sort of sacrifice on the altar of pu the sort of policy, pu pure policy position of a plan that from day one is, is Medicare for all, um, the, um, the, the, rea the, real the political reality that at the moment the proposals that the candidates are, put are putting forth are on the outer edges of political possibility seems to me to be um, short-sighted. But I, I, want to st I want this movement single payer, the single payer movement, to be a, a partner toward expansion of c coverage as enthusiastic about this action as, as humanly possible. And so to me that's, and I think what Ezra was saying was absolutely right, that this has to be something where there is pressure that's not just coming from those who are opposed to reform, but from those who believe that change needs to be even more dramatic um, than what may be possible in the, in, the, in the present moment. So to me, that, that this, this is one of those moments where there's a constructive dynamic that could be forged as long as it takes place on, on a playing field in which we are recognize that we're trying to achieve the same ultimate set of goals. I would love to have a situation in which Dr. Woolhandler of Physicians for National Healthcare, if I don't have that wrong, is the Malcolm X of health reform and Jacob <laughs> is the Martin Luther King. So it, it's, all, it's all one fight here, guys. Everybody's on the same team. And at the end of the day, you just hit, you, you know, the focus has to be on winning, not having, not having your section of the coalition emerge triumphant and not have to compromise. That's, that, I think, is something important to take from here. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Stephen Spitz. I'm a co-state director in Virginia for Progressive Democrats of America. I, too, am a supporter of single payer. And I have two very specific questions and concerns. One, I fully agree with Jacob Hacker's comment that we have to take on the private insurance companies. We have to, it's going to be called socialized medicine, his plan, any plan that, that goes that way. So we might as well take it on fully and go for single payer, point one. Point two is as the plan, I mean the uh, uh, projections on private insurance shows that it's more and more expensive, that Medicare is cheaper, the simple way to get the passion that Ezra is talking about, the support, is by talking about single payer directly, talking about what you're talking about as a transition to single payer, and, but the objective is single payer, and the reason for it is not just ideological, but it is more cost efficient. The figures on there, private insurance is more and more expensive. One thing that wasn't talked about is the pharmaceutical companies. You got to tell them we need your drugs, but we can't have you at the table saying that we cannot negotiate prices with you, which is of course what they put in the Medicare Part B. And we can't have you say that we can't have reimportation of the Canadian uh, from Canada of U.S. drugs because the Canadian government can negotiate drug prices with the American drug companies. So we have to take on not only insurance companies but the drug companies and go for single payer. It's my duty to bring this to an end. We've got another session that's, uh, that's coming up that I have to go moderate. Um, but uh, this is going to be a continuing discussion throughout the conference. Please come back tomorrow where we will have representatives of lots of the different parts of the coalition that we're talking about. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing discussion. I want to thank all of our panelists. It's been a great, great discussion. <laughs>